Hey there gang, we got the go-ahead to repair this Takamini with the damaged soundboard. I know some of you are very anxious about it. Every time I say the word about, I have to check myself to make sure I'm not being too dang Canadian. Just a reminder, or a recap, this started off with the bridge coming loose along the back edge. Uh, at the factory they glued it on over top of the lacquer on the sides here and tried to depend on epoxy to fill the gap between the bottom of the bridge and the soundboard. That's not a recipe for success, especially if you don't put enough on there. The soundboard is deformed and broken between the bridge pin holes here, which is bad, but the bridge plate underneath is also broken, which is much worse, because I'm going to have to remove it, and that's up there on the list of annoying jobs. We've got these two positioning studs here, and I don't like them. We're going to get rid of those, and I'll tell you why. If uh, a bridge like this starts to come unglued along the back edge, the way they often do, if these studs remain glued to that bridge, when it starts tipping forward, you've made two excellent levers to do damage to the soundboard. The same thing happens up front here with that big thick metal pickup that was sitting in that channel. Um, they basically become like a pry bar, a lever. You're just doing this to the soundboard. I complained about that in the last video. I'm going to start by paring away some of the loose and bulging stuff by hand. I want to get it out of the way so that I can have sort of a level surface to work with. Yeah, I know my cuticles are a mess. I'm a guitar repair guy. If manicures are important to you, you should probably be watching an accounting channel. Or maybe even a manicure channel. But stay away from auto repair people, carpenters, and guitar repair guys if hangnails offend you. So we know the bridge pad is just about 80 thousandths or 2 millimeters thick. This is a very unique situation, having this nice big hole in the top right where I'm trying to work. Because not only can I look down through there and see what's going on in a mirror, but I can also access the joint between the um, soundboard and the bridge pad. And it might go easier because of this. I've got my little bridge heater here. And uh, this is a plywood call that uh, fits on one of my um, bridge clamps here. So I'm going to get that heated up and we'll start. This is the kind of thing that takes patience. Um, you can't rush this job. It, it goes at the speed it wants to go. Having got the bridge plate warm enough to work with, I can slide my bent pallet knife in from behind and gradually work my way back and forth, separating it a little bit at a time. Um, it's sort of a prying motion slash slicing motion, although I do try to keep the edge of the pallet knife really flat against the surface of the wood so I'm not doing any damage to the underside of the top or worse yet prying so hard that it would split. As things start to cool off I'll have to reheat the surface. I tend to use the smaller bridge pad heaters. They make ones that are designed to take off the whole thing at once. I never have any luck with that so I kind of spot heat in the area I'm working on and go back and forth uh, from one side to the other. Here you can see I can get the pallet knife in a skinny one from the top, which is uh, kind of nice. <laughs> All right. Ooh. Nice. I've cut out the new bridge pad. It's maple again. You can see that I've cut it so that the grain crosses it at an angle relative to the original one here. I've also made it about 5% thicker, uh, just for a little extra stiffness. I think we're going to need it in this case. And uh, yes, it's quarter sawn. We've been through this before. Both quarter sawn and flat sawn bridge pads will crack. I like the quarter sawn ones because they're more dimensionally stable, they're less likely to cup over time or peel up on the edges. And I also made a clamping call. Before I glue in the bridge pad, I need to figure out what I want to do with the damaged section of the soundboard here. I could glue the pad in first and then come along with a router, route out a channel and make a straight butt joint graft. 
but I think it would be far stronger, especially in this case where the front edge here is unsupported, to cut an angle and make this into a scarf joint. In other words, we'll bevel the material that's left on the soundboard under and then cut a corresponding angle on the, um, the patch part so that the two lock together. I just want to make sure it's as strong and give it every chance possible. This soundboard cuts and smells like cedar to me. I think this is a cedar top guitar. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to inlay cedar. I might use spruce. I'm sanding the angle on the underside of the soundboard, turning into a nice knife edge there. I'm ready for the glue up here. I marked the back edge where the bevel is here because I don't want to get a whole lot of glue squeeze out in that area when it comes time to put the new piece in. So I'm going to stay away from that back edge here. Clamp and call. This is covered with packing tape. That's an important step. I worked on a guitar once where someone had done a bridge re-glue and they had not um, glue proofed their call and it was stuck in there permanently. Don't be that guy. On top, folded over piece of paper towel here for a little bit of cushion and a flat block. Now this is going to clamp things relatively flat. Like, it's going to take some of the natural arch out of the soundboard. I don't mind that in this case because certainly string tension will want to pull it up again and there's probably enough memory in the soundboard to retrieve some of that arch. Um, a little bit of flatness is not going to hurt us in this case, especially where there was a bit of a hump to begin with. The first clamp is the tricky one. The last clamp is also the tricky one. I cut the inlay patch. I'm just checking to make sure it fits snugly and goes together cleanly. Then it's time to glue it in place. You could have debates over which adhesive is the best to use. I use tight bond. We'll get that clamp down firmly in place. Rather than using round dowels to plug those uh, positioning stud holes, I decided to turn them into squares so that all the grain would be running in the same direction. Chiseling down some of the excess. I decided it was a good time to start excavating the gorge for the pickup here. Just going through the spruce at this point. Um, I'll use a router to get through the maple underneath. Then it's time to um, scribe out the outline for the bridge. This has to be done really carefully. I've mentioned this before. You don't want to go too deep. Um, if you go through the finish and into the wood, then you can cause weak spots, which uh, eventually could cause the bridge to fail uh, or the soundboard beneath it to tear up if it um, starts to let go at some point. See if we can measure this flake of finish and epoxy here. Seems pretty thick. Twenty thousandths. That's half a millimeter. That is a lot of plastic for this thing to be sitting on. So it's basically getting a neck reset at the same time. I might have to make a taller saddle by the time we're through because we're lowering the bridge a significant amount. Just to be clear, friends, this is not an inexpensive guitar. It's not a low-end model. I think this thing retails for $1,600, $1,700. So, you know, questions are raised. And when it comes down to it, we, when we put the bridge back on, we're basically going to be inlaying it below the surface of the top. Twenty thousandths of an inch, half a millimeter. Which means 
in the future, if it ever has to come off again, there's no elegant way to do that, right? Most of my guitars usually end up being four to five thousandths of an inch. This finish is about four times thicker than normal, or what I would consider acceptable. So, you know, this is, we gotta be really careful with the glue up, because you don't ever want this thing to come up again. If it does, you know, this is sort of a one-time only repair, which is something I hate, but what are you gonna do? I'm going to sand everything nice and flat and smooth. This is a 3 8 inch um, template cutting bit from Stuart McDonald, which is really nice. It's Most of the ones that you'll find in the woodworking supply catalogs are half inch diameter. 3 8 is um, it's a bit of a luxury. It lets me get down in this uh, slot, which is about 11 millimeters, just under half an inch wide. So I'm going to be keying off the, um, the gorge that I cut through the spruce. And I've already removed a good portion of the uh, maple using uh, saws and chisels, so this is just cleaning up the outline here. I tried to use Evan Gluck's trick of sanding the bridge to shape with adhesive paper down in the outline, which is usually about as thick as the lacquer is on the guitar, but that was impossible this time because the finish is so thick that there's nowhere to move it, it doesn't wiggle. So I'm relying on good preparation and cleanliness wiping the base of the bridge with acetone to remove any rosewood oils or resin and get a good glue bond. And then uh, just going to glue it up like normal. Just doing a little fret work here. I don't think that's the original nut. It's bone. I'm going to want to do some things to that I'm pretty sure. I don't know if it works yet but it's inelegant. I'm telling you, you want a fun time, you try putting one of these things back in place. I don't want to sound sanctimonious about this stuff, but it seems to me if you're going to make someone a fresh bone nut and saddle that the standard has to be for it to look and perform as good if not much better than something that comes from the factory. I see a lot of them that are like 80% of the way there. Alright, this has been sitting for over a day under string tension and I think that's important before you start going about doing the final tweaks to the setup because there is a sort of settling in period. I likened it to major surgery and that's exactly what this is. This is this was a transplant. We removed the malfunctioning organ, the bridge pad, and that's an integral part of the system for transferring the string vibration into the top. So altering that, that's going to have some effect. And in addition, we changed the attachment, uh, removing all that finish and epoxy, that potential dampening barrier between the two parts. So we'd hope that the transfer of vibration has been made more efficient and will get more and better sound out of it. I have no frame of reference in this case. I didn't hear it before the damage. So still, I think we have to see any improvement as incremental in this case. Um, this thing is never going to function like a race car in fully acoustic mode. Um, the pickup system, the design for it, the concessions it makes precludes that. Uh, it's probably a very good stage instrument, and that's what some people need, you know, willing to sacrifice the acoustic sound for an electric one. It happens. The other thing is, after this kind of surgery, it'll usually take a couple of days for the guitar to get back up on its feet. You can actually hear it open up. Um, they start off sounding kind of tight and tinny, and then they get settled in and they sort of blossom. In the last video I talked about psychoacoustics, and maybe this is part of it, but I experience that every time I build one and play it for this first time, or in this kind of job where it's been a major alteration to the soundboard around the bridge. You know, it feels real to me, for what it's worth. Anyway, thanks for joining me again. I'll play a few bars on this thing so you can hear what it sounds like. <laughs>